I'd like to introduce our moderator. Um, he's my boss, so I'll admit I put a little bit more time and attention his, into writing his intro. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but seriously. Uh, he comes to us with almost 20 years of startup experience, a strong background in technology and biz dev, and four years at Taftail. Um, you can often find his daughters in our offices uh, voting for their favorite icon or just making short music videos. It's my pleasure to introduce Guy Tomer, CMO of Taptail. <laughs> Our first finalist is Noah Adamski, VP Product at Phantomic. Noah recently moved to the gaming industry after 10 years of product management at LivePerson. So she has some fresh new perspective insights on our industry. Noah is not only a creative and an innovative executive, but she's also a mother of three kids that loves spending her money on casual games. Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Adamski. <laughs> oh, sorry. Now I'd like to introduce to the panel a woman who is not only a leading entrepreneur and marketing strategist, but she's also an Olympic medalist in judo. In fact, she was the first Israeli to win an Olympic medal, and she's here today with us to show off her skills. Um, of course, I'm joking. Um, after a very successful career in sports, she dove straight into the marketing and kids' mobile content and hasn't looked back since. Please give a big round of applause to Mrs. Yael Arad, CMO of Merchandise Division, Viacom Israel. Um, so Dylan Collins won't be joining us, but instead today we have our next panelist that comes to us all the way from rainy London to enjoy some better weather and to share his monetization expertise with us. He's currently the head of mobile at Super Awesome, the largest digital marketing platform for kids in the world. Please help me welcome to the panel and to Israel, Fabienne Alexander. And now, for our next and final panelist, um, after he took care of the singles and his successful dating sites, as you probably know, Jaded and Cupid, um, he's now dedicated to saving parents. And uh, he's tried to do that, he's doing that by actually uh, giving kids the freedom to enjoy online content 24 seven without supervision. With over 20 years of experience in product management and biz dev, Eldad Ben Torah. He is the CRO and co-founder co of Kiddos. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kids safe content discovery network and Kiddos, by the way, has been nominated as one of the best kids tech product by Business Week. Uh, Guy, I'll let you uh, have the mic. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to moderate this panel. My name is Guy. I've been leading Taptail's marketing and monetization efforts for the last four years with, uh, as Sagi told you earlier, about 400 apps of marketing. So I know how big that this challenge is and I think this panel is going to be very interesting to hear some real tips from the real world from people who work in this industry. First to warm up a little bit, uh, this is a surprise also for the panelists, to warm up a little bit after lunch, let's see how is your hunch working with uh, marketing to kids? So in Taptel, when we prepare the icons, we, we do some A-B testing to see which icon is going to work best for the kids. And we use some tools, some Google tools, Edmob tools for that. And uh, so this is the first one. This is a great app that we made uh, for museum. And we made these two, these two icons. Some of you may have seen the answer already when it was zipped, but who thinks in the A-B testing between these two icons, who thinks that the uh, A won? Panelists, you can uh, join the, the quiz. Who thinks A won? Nice. Who think the, I assume the rest think that B won, or they don't think anything, but most of you think that A won. And you're right. We tried to simulate something from the real world, but I guess uh, the kids like the, 
the selfie stuff in the first icon. The next icon, Cheating Tom, is one of our most uh, known franchises. So uh, the app is about uh, cheating in your exam, in your exams. So who thinks that A1 in the A-B testing? Like uh, five people, and I don't count you at the top. <laughs> <laughs> don't put your hands up anymore, please. So let's say three people think that A1, and they did win. So this was a surprise for us as well. I think it's something about the colors of B that could be annoying for some people. Last one for now, and we will have uh, three more at the end of the panel, so you have uh, another good reason to stay, but this is the last one for now. I think this one is easy. I will be really surprised if not everyone knows the answer, but who thinks that uh, A1? Like six people only thinks that A1. A1 by far. Don't think it's a surprise. It's a great icon, really catches your eye. So, uh, okay, so you have what to learn, I think. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, I will first start with an intro introduction, please. Uh, Monica already introduced you, but if you can say a few more words about yourself and your experience in this industry. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, so, my name is Noah Adamski, and I'm VP Product at Phantomic. And I joined Phantomic six months ago after uh, 15 years in product management, uh, mainly around more business systems. And uh, games have always been a hobby, and I couldn't uh, wait to have kids and uh, let them play with me. And uh, I'm very happy today to play uh, all kinds of casual games myself and with my kids. So when I heard Phantomic has an opening, I jumped it. And Phantomic is a, a, a gaming company. We mainly do uh, three things. We own the, uh, the Kizzy uh, brand, uh, which millions of kids flock to every month. Uh, we also we are a publisher, and we partner with many developers, not just to publish their games, but also to help them uh, develop and think about their audience. And we also develop our own games. So that's a little about me and about uh, Phantomic. So hello everybody, you hear me? Yeah? Okay, so uh, as uh, has been said before, I uh, started my uh, career in life in the age of eight and uh, retired from sport uh, when I was uh, 29 and decided to move on. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, to have a career from the age of eight till 80 uh, to take my hobby and uh, turn it into a uh, my profession, so I uh, leave, uh, left uh, sport and uh, moved into business. And uh, actually, uh, everybody asked me how come an athlete, worldwide athlete, uh, became uh, someone that uh, takes part in uh, the merchandise and licensing uh, uh, space. But if you imagine, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, uh, Michael Jordan or Carl Lewis, or today uh, LeBron James or uh, Federer or each one of the big athletes around the world. Usain Bolt, so you know it's uh, quite similar to the terms of uh, SpongeBob, Dora, uh, you know, Frozen, etc. If you want to license them or uh, take advantage uh, on the brand and the values of the brand, so uh, uh, somehow I found myself after uh, around 2000 when I retired in uh, '96 after Atlanta Olympic Games and uh, found myself. Uh, into this business of licensing, merchandise. I started 10 years in the industry of uh, real world, of the products, of producing, of retail, and uh, actually a company that did everything from uh, the idea to the billing. And uh, then I moved uh, into the area which I like uh, the most, uh, the connection between the real world, the physical uh, products, to the digital and uh, the you know, uh, the virtual world. So uh, I started to work with Mogabi, which is a virtual world uh, for kids, Israeli virtual world, like uh, many others that you know around the world, uh, but very successful one here in Israel. Uh, above a million uh, children that uh, are playing uh, with, uh, you know, playing th uh, during the years. And uh, um, today I'm uh, involved and uh, actually represent uh, Viacom in Israel, in all kind of uh, merchandise licensing, also uh, uh, 
consumer products and uh, of course uh, branding for food and all others and uh, still working with uh, Mogobi. And uh, during this, I started also to work a little bit uh, with uh, startups, uh, business development, and uh, other things. So that's me. I'm also involved in the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, in the Marketing uh, Commission, and uh, other stuff. Great. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, I don't think everyone knows this, but I used to be an athlete as well, um, alongside Yale. Um, Used to be a 100 meter sprinter, uh, one of the top sprinters in, in the UK, um, training with top sprinters like uh, Dwayne Chambers, Jeanette Cratchy. Um, left that 2002, 2000 and to 2006, and started working as a broker in finance, um, but also working in advertising with uh, some TV moguls like James Kahn, um, and then moved into working with kids and parents in, for big organizations like TSL. And uh, most recently, T, uh, sorry, uh, Super Awesome, uh, which is essentially the largest marketing platform for kids in the world. Um, we provide a safe avenue for, for brands and agencies to reach kids in a somewhat fragmented market. Um, we've got the first ad uh, copper compliant um, ad server, uh, providing again that comfort for ad advertisers and brands to reach the kids in, in the right way and in a safe way. Okay, hi. My intro will do nothing with sports, sorry. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, my name is Eldad and I've joined uh, Kiddos about two years ago after my uh, company was sold uh, successfully, not Jaded and Cupid, the other one. And I actually understood that I have a few more years to be relevant. Uh, to the industry, and uh, I joined Kiddos as a co-founder. And uh, Kiddos is a, is a content recommendation uh, engine or platform, and the way we are being distributed is, is we are uh, downloaded by parents on Google Play, several millions, and we also do deals with device manufacturers, so they preload Kiddos as their solution. So we operate, we operate as their Kids OS is their kid solution on, on several millions other devices, uh, which makes us in a very strong point in the uh, navigation stage of the kid. They, they open their new tablet, kiddos is what they see, so the stuff we recommend is highly powerful for them. That's it. Okay, so it's interesting. We have uh, someone from uh, mobile and web, someone from the kids uh, social, I can call it, uh, someone from the advertisement for kids space and marketing, and uh, someone who deals actually with the devices themselves. So it's a very diverse and sportive panel. I think the first uh, question that I'd like to ask you, many people here talked about kids, about marketing to kids, or building uh, games for kids, or content for kids. Uh, how do you see the term kids? Is, it really, is there really something that that you can say, you can call it kids in general, or there are actually many, many different segments uh, for different ages. What's your experience with that? So our experience at Phantomic is uh, mainly around Kizi. Uh, we mainly see kids around uh, between the ages 7 to 12. So this is our main audience, and we look at them as, as one segment, main segment. Um, I can also talk from my personal experience as a parent of three kids who loves games. Um, and it was also previously mentioned here that um, one, one of the reasons for kids to play games is sometimes to play with their parents, and some of the exploration is done with the parents, some parent involvement. And also, I see that the kids imitate parents in the way they explore applications. So, for example, if I walk into the app store and I look for the featured uh, games, my kids see me do that. So they learn all those techniques also from their parents. So I also see a great audience in kids and parents together, and I think that is an additional segment we need to think about. So I think uh, that we see during the last 10 years a big change in uh, the segmentation of uh, kids around the world. Uh, if uh, once upon a time we had one channel of kids, black and white, and uh, we saw only you know three hours a day uh, TV for kids and only TV, so today you can see that uh, two to five or two to four is the preschool, uh, uh, the new preschoolers, because once uh, or pre-kinder, uh, 
uh, garden and uh, uh, this is a very strong segment today. We know that they hardly influence on the, their parents in terms of uh, take the wallet and buy, but the influence in terms of their heavy users and parents are happy to have a nice babysitter with uh, all the uh, games and everything. So this is a segment that uh, many years ago uh, didn't exist. We see uh, the five uh, to eight, which used to be five to 11 or uh, six to 12, but today uh, kids are much more mature. And uh, we see it also in the virtual world and also in uh, the physical uh, merchandise uh, products that uh, today kids, if you ask, you go to Toys R Us and you ask uh, uh, the people there, uh, who, is, who are the buyers? So if you remember, if you're uh, older enough uh, with the older kids, so before uh, kids 12 years old would buy a Toys R Us. Today, above eight years old, kids would not buy uh, brands or toys because they have uh, apps and, uh, and uh, many other devices. So we see that five to eight or nine uh, depends in countries and areas and also in periphery or center, you know, depends. Uh, how, uh, what is the uh, economic uh, at house. So uh, this is another segment. And we see the, the twins, the teens that, uh, you know, you can say it's uh, uh, 10 to 14 and some places it's uh, 8 to 14. And this is a segment much more adult, you know, a mature segment that uh, uh, it's easier to, uh, to target this uh, segment uh, because uh, they go by themselves from school to their houses. They have some pocket money in their, uh, in their uh, pocket. They know how to uh, uh, act with uh, all the devices and uh, they can call mommy or daddy and ask uh, you know, to upload things. So this is a main segment I think that today when we look at merchandise or other uh, activities, this is a segment that you can uh, uh, have uh, you know, a discussion and dialogue on uh, on uh, how to uh, uh, have uh, their income or the outcome and etc. So today the segmentation is uh, totally different than what we used to see before. Yeah, I definitely echo that. Um, if you if you look at it from uh, you know ten years ago, you're right. Kids, you could probably reach kids on one you know main medium, which was TV or even retail. Um, nowadays they're scattered, you know, all over the place. It's hugely fragmented at the moment. Um, here at Super Awesome, we sort of look at um, three different areas or verticals, whether it's the preschools, which is three to six-year-olds, or um, tweens, seven to twelve-year-olds, and also even teens. And you know, you've got to look at them as different areas because you can't um, communicate with, uh, say, preschool and expect that to have the same effect on on teenagers. Um, it just doesn't work like that. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's, that's something which you know, you have to understand and understand each kid, is, it's completely different. Um, parents also are involved in that as aspect as well, whether they're online or on apps together. Um, you know, it can have a big effect on, you know, I, guess I don't want to sort of say it, but pester power. You know, kids uh, definitely have a big influence on, on where that money is being spent nowadays compared to, you know, quite a few years ago. Do we all need to answer? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, I'll just highlight two things. Shortly, I think that kids are jumping given, you know, multiple generations within their childhood. So, you know, the, the, the stuff they played until, you know, a year ago is completely childish for them now. So we, we need to fight and, 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 and bring new, cha new challenges for the kids every day. And the whole segmenta segmentations or trying to divide kids into categories of ages, I think it's, it's beginning to fall apart because my five-year-old and your five-year-old is actually are totally different. And we need to market based on interest and based on what they're looking for, to, like to do now. And I don't think there's an age for smashing flies. I don't think there's an age for you know throwing uh, birds. So the whole talk about ages, I, I don't think it's it's relevant anymore. You're actually saying things a little different from the rest. Yeah, I try. No, it's good. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, the, uh, we are all sleep. children in heart, right? I think that, uh, you know, you can, uh, of course, uh, as you present it, uh, it might uh, be in a uh, few areas, but if you see, uh, I don't know, uh, cognitive, cognitive, uh, cognitive, if you, if you uh, look cognitive or uh, you look, uh, you know, uh, 
let's say take uh, Dora or take a drama uh, or a telenovela in a TV world. So not everything is application. And uh, the kids, they have a lot of uh, uh, area where they have interest and uh, not everything is, you know, push and uh, uh, do this. So I think that uh, emotionally, cognitive and uh, many other abilities, they are totally different. And of course, there are things that they can uh, do mutually together. I'm just saying, like, learn ABC for, you know, for uh, Brian, Brian? Uh, Fabian. Uh, Fabian, <laughs> Fabian kids are uh, at the age of two, but for my kids, could be could happen at the age of seven, so, because they're learning learning as a second language, so, again, it's not, you know, strict. Okay, makes sense, so, the, I think uh, it's only natural to, how do you advertise to, to get kids, I mean, with all these difficulties that you were saying now, how do you do advertisement, or if you are on the mobile or the web, how do you do user acquisition, or in other platforms to, to direct it to the audience that you want? Eldad, do you want to start this time? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, we're, uh, we're being downloaded through Google Play by parents that are seeking a safe uh, mode for their kids and, and preloaded on devices, which, which enables us not to buy traffic. We actually know that marketing for kids is so hard, so we took it as a mission. We understood that we need to help developers reach kids and, and vice versa. Uh, and, and this is why we created the, the, uh, the content recommendation platform uh, to help developers reach kids exactly what they're looking for. So today, buying media, buying users is, is, uh, makes relatively no sense for most uh, developers here. If they're making you know, 10, 20 cents lifetime value per user, what What's the point in buying user for a dollar or two? So it, it completely makes no sense. And, and I think what's, what's uh, good happening is that companies like Super Awesome and, and, and so on and Kidos is trying to make app developers earn more from their apps so they would be able to pay more for user acquisition. So I think I'm, I'm happy that things like us are, are happening, but still it's, it's quite a difficult to, to be an app developer for kids. Yeah, I, I definitely have to agree with that one. Um, it's there's so much red tape in the kids industry. Um, you know, rights of copper um, and other legislations like in, in the EU and soon to be for the rest of the world. Um, for us, um, we help uh, developers sort of, I guess, not to worry about the back end stuff and all of the, the red tape which is there, um, and we help them focus on creating content which is going to engage kids and, and excite them. Um, while we will look after the, uh, you know, the back end and the legislations which they you know, the hoops have to go over. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's all important. It, it's really important to, to make sure that you're creating fresh content on a daily basis um, you know, so that these kids are engaged because they're quite fickle and they're quite ruthless as well and they won't you know, hesitate to, to move away from, from one site to another. So since I came from the, you know, uh, more, more uh, old industry of uh, uh, products, so I still believe that uh, we have to combine or we have the ability to combine in marketing between the, the new world, the, you know, the devices, the, the web, the digital, and the, the old uh, fashion world. So first of all, it's very important where the source is. If the brand uh, uh, was born uh, by a movie of Disney or uh, you know others or uh, the brand was uh, born uh, with TV series which is uh, still a thing the most uh, successful strongest uh, media around the world or it came like Angry Bird or all other uh, you know Kizzy or all other uh, uh, brands that uh, we know from from uh, the digital and then I think that uh, most of us uh, wants to have the platform that we don't have so if I come from the retail, I want a TV. If I'm a TV, I want uh, many times to be in a virtual world or, or to try to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, advertising in, uh, in uh, the digital. So I think that uh, the combination, the 360 uh, uh, degrees is the, is the best one. I, I have a very strong amplifier in my back of TV. You know, Nickelodeon is the leading uh, uh, TV channel in Israel. And when I have to uh, promote or uh, do a business development to SpongeBob or uh, Paw Patrol, if you know, the, the leading uh, uh, preschool uh, brand today in the world. 
So it's very easy for me because I have a TV show, you know, uh, every day. All the kids in Israel uh, will see it, so I don't have to explain to them what is a uh, Paw Patrol. But still, if you can uh, get to their parents in a good shelf in the retail, or I can go to the kindergarten and give them a sample, or I can, uh, which in a small country like Israel, it's uh, possible. Or I can uh, be in uh, high traffic uh, places uh, like, uh, you know, digital world. Uh, or uh, for uh, oldest uh, uh, kids uh, to use, of course, uh, today they no, don't use, I think, uh, Facebook anymore, but uh, Instagram or uh, Snapchat or all the, uh, the media that uh, they use or platforms. So I think that uh, the whole six, 360 will work better than only working in one place. And many times to use the uh, traffic of other uh, channels that maybe want uh, or need my, uh, my platform and can give me their platform and do the combination. I think uh, this is, it works very well. Yeah, just to add to that as well, kids, um, if you, you can't really focus on one area, one vertical like TV anymore, um, if, you, if you probably look at your kids nowadays or if you've seen kids, you'll see that they're watching TV, they're on their mobile and laptop and tablet all at the same time. So they're multi-screening yeah. all at once and they're very good at doing it as well. Uh, as well. well. Yeah, exactly. Um, we are very like, lucky to have a very strong brand, so we let it get a lot of organic traffic into all of our assets, if it's uh, web, mobile web, and the uh, stores. Uh, but we do advertise, and one of the things we do is bring back our players. So if you go and you play on Kizi, sometimes we get you know players all ages. Some tell us uh, we play like, uh, we feel like a kid again when we play on Kizi. So we make sure to advertise also to bring them back and do some retargeting. Okay, so um, I think you and Yael already touched this point of building a brand. I think obviously the best solution to save the money of advertising is to have a brand and then they come to you. Can you share us some of your experience? How, how does it work to build a completely new brand? I mean, there are the examples that Yael said, obviously Dora and uh, Nickelodeon and Disney and their brands. But they usually either come from the movies or they have the strongest channels on TV, so we know how they do it. Doesn't mean that we can do it, but we know at least how they do it. But how do you build a brand if you don't have these uh, strong channels? Um, so I uh, joined Phantomic uh, six months ago, so I can share with you all the knowledge that was shared with me. So, I mean, of course, uh, good luck can always help, but it starts by having a catchy name. So thinking about a name like Kizi is something I can... Uh, be really remembered easily. Then it comes to with the creation of an emotional attachment. So using, using a friendly character, as we all know in many of our assets, this is one of the main thing. And uh, Kizi, you know, he, this one-eyed green, and we ask kids, and some say it's an alien, some say it's a dinosaur, some say it's a dragon. So it's their imagination that can speak to it. Um, and then comes the real hard work. Okay, so you thought a name, you have a character, but then you have to know your audience. You know, to need to love your audience, and you need to think about what is the content that goes with this brand identity, and make sure all the time. And we have very hardworking content teams and marketing teams thinking all the time about this theme of Kizi and what it means, and which games do Kizi kids love, and which games players come back and check out again, and again, and to see and how long do they play, and make sure we know the essence of the content that we need to add in order to maintain that brand. That takes a lot of research and data and understanding and just loving your audience. Yeah, anything to add about that for Mogobi maybe? I, I see totally uh, different from uh, you know uh, most of people because uh, I think that one of the hardest things is to build uh, a brand and uh, if you look at uh, Warner Brothers, Disney, Nickelodeon, many, many, and all of you that sit here, I think uh, we all uh, dream to build a, a strong uh, brand. But if you look at it really carefully inside, I think there are two keys. One, it's a casino. If you take, if you take really the company that built Pokemon, okay? The name is Pokemon uh, LTD. So when they built Pokemon and they brought the uh, manga uh, to, the w to the Western world, everybody thought later on in 2000 that now they can do it because they saw the good guy, the bad guy, the, trans the transformation that the, the characters are having. And then they thought, okay, let's do it. And then one company came and brought uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! And then all the companies in the world tried to, to make the, the new uh, Pokemon and 
most of them failed. Until the manga, if you see today, it's hardly you can see it. So I think that uh, there, are, there is the methodology of uh, bring, uh, building a brand, and we all can talk now, hours and hours, how to build a brand. But if the kids don't want it, they don't want it. And uh, you can't help it. So you can bring something really good, and then if they don't want it, you cannot explain why. Many times you just cannot explain why. You say, I put all the money, I did everything right, and it didn't work. So this is one thing, but I'm not a great believer in uh, luck, I believe in hard work, and uh, I think that the, the main key eventually is distribution. I think you are a very good example, uh, your company, where today when you want to bring a new uh, game to the kids, uh, world of kids, you just put it in your, on your platform with the, the best uh, distribution uh, you can have in, a, in the apps world, and probably will gain much better uh, percentage of uh, uploads and I will bring maybe a better uh, application, but I would never win without a distribution. It, it's totally the same in the real world. If you don't uh, have a good distribution, many times uh, entrepreneurs come to me and say, listen, I have a very good idea, listen, I, pr I produce this, I have molds in China and everything. And I said, but do you have a uh, distribution? I say, no. So you can never win. You need a good distribution in order to get to the last consumer through the retail. You have a different retail, the real world has uh, different retails, but if you don't have a distribution, it's not enough to have a good product. Fabian, anything? Maybe from your experience working with the brands, how they see it? Yeah, I, um, I, think, um, I think content is quite key. Again, it's, it's about producing the right stuff for the right age groups. Um, but I think for my, for my time, what I've seen, which has been quite repetitive is if you've got good dwell time, if you've got users staying on a particular property uh, for a long time, uh, then, you, then you're, you're in, in the right direction uh, because I think that's important because it means that you're producing the right content, uh, kids are being engaged, uh, they're also you know, socially talking about this as well, keeping them on there as well. Um, so it's really important. Um, but yeah, if you've got the right channels, I think um, you know, that's a, that's a building block really to, to a good thing and, and luck does come into it as well. <laughs> Definitely does. And that, anything to add about that? No? Okay, the next question is a bit more focused on apps in the App Store, but I think it can be looked at also in general. How do you see the fact that uh, both Apple and Google Play, they decided to create a separate area for kids and for family? Like they have the App Store for games and everything, and they have a separate area for that. Do you see it as a smart decision? Do you see the, the logic in that? And no. Go ahead. <laughs> so as a consumer of games, for me, it's very easy as a mother now to go into this section and explore for games for and my kids. And you use it? Yes, I use it. And, you know, for us, uh, of course, we want to be there because we know there are uh, kids and, and parents that are there. Um, I actually sat down with my kids last evening and I asked them about it. And my daughter said, you know, mom, I'm more interested in the no Wi-Fi area <laughs> of the store, for example, because she doesn't have such a big data plan. Uh, so she's also very uh, concerned about a data plan and she looks into that too. Um, so it's very interesting, all of those segmentation inside the, the stores. I'll be the devil advocate again. I think that uh, it's too late, too little, and, uh, and it may be helping parents, but it's not solving the problem of uh, discoverability with kids. Uh, kids don't go to the app store. I'm talking about the ages, like the younger ages. Uh, and I'll use an example when I, that I see with my kids. Uh, you know, when they come to me and they say, I'm hungry, what do you think will happen if I'll tell them, go to the fridge? How old are they, I must ask? No, I have all ages. <laughs> No, but th th I'll get the same answer. They say it does nothing to eat, or they would take the chocolate cake and eat it. That's the same the way it works with the store. Th they don't have the patience, the capability to browse uh, segments and read reviews, and like they, they will flip the whole store in like one swipe. That's, th like, th that's the store for them. We, we need to find a better way for them to discover things. And it should be, if I'm going back to the fridge example, it's, it's, we need to feed them in a creative way uh, with new content, but only few options because they cannot, uh, you know, uh, stand multiple decisions. And we need to be creative in presenting it, in plating it, in 
tzilchut, as they say, right? We need to give it in a, in, a, in a creative way for them. So stores, segments, not for kids. I think it's a bit of a generalization. I don't think all kids are that in need to be fed and unable to, to choose, right? I mean, yeah, if you take Kizi, for example, you have this huge catalog of games and we see that there are preferences uh, of kids. So, I mean, on, in one way, it's sort of a fridge because it has a lot. But on the other way, there is uh, a matter of taste and a matter of choosing, so. Oh, but I think also that... The smaller uh, fridge, right? I think, <laughs> I, I must admit that I uh, agree with you because I think that the immediate satisfaction, this is the main key for kids. They want everything here and now. And uh, they don't want to go to, and they don't like to read anymore. And so immediate satisfaction is always uh, the main key for us in a kid's marketing. So, thank you. Okay, uh, there's one point that was discussed a little bit earlier about uh, localization. I mean, uh, like Disney brands, obviously kids all over the world like them. How do you see localization for kids? Uh, I heard the guy earlier in the morning, he said it doesn't really, it's not really necessary uh, unless you do something really targeted for education to teach something, but otherwise uh, he said in his opinion it, it's not really necessary. Wh what do you think about localization? in content for, for kids. Okay, so um, actually here I can speak from my previous product management experience. Um, do you read everything in the interfaces of the <laughs> systems you use? People don't read unless they have to. When do we read something in, in the application, right? When I wait for my clash of clans to load, sometimes I read those tips that tell me, you know, uh, which one can hit better and uh, uh, all of those things. When I'm in a waiting room and there's a sign of some information, I may read it. But people don't read. Uh, they don't want to think, and kids are just the same even more. Uh, if you can uh, pass the message in a non-textual way, that is the best thing, right? We put a big button in every form uh, and we just, you know, make sure people click on it because this is what they need to do next and we don't want to put too much text to explain it. Um, but when it comes to kids and to uh, operating globally, you need to think more uh, than localization, you can think about culturalization. So what can be different in the c different cultures and the tastes in different regions of the world. And one example I can give from Kizi is that if you surf to kizi.com from different areas around the world, you will see a different sort of the catalog of games. Because from our data and research, we see different preferences of which games bubble up and are more interesting to our audiences. So if you have to invest in look, thinking globally, think a lot about culture and try to make all your messaging very, very visual and less textual. I agree. Uh, because I think uh, really that uh, uh, culturalization is, is something very important, but also I think that uh, it depends uh, if you come from a small country with a different strange language like uh, Hebrew, or you come from a you know, big area, uh, French, American, or Spanish, which are uh, the Chinese, uh, that are really big areas uh, where the, the language and the culture is uh, big, so then uh, it's a bit different. Uh, I think, uh, anyway, when I look at kids, you know, if you have kids and you go uh, through the highway and you see the M of McDonald's, the kids, even if they are three years old, they will see the M, they will smell the, the hamburger and they will think about the, the present. They know M is a present in McDonald's. They don't need to read. Uh, they have a very good uh, visual uh, memory and uh, that's how they uh, navigate themselves in all the apps and everything. They see the, the logo, the the word and the, they immediately understand what it is uh, from already very early stage. But still I think that uh, uh, the culture is something important and the preference and the, uh, when you want to work globally, you have to think. I, I brought uh, Webkins to Israel uh, a few years ago. If you rem remember, Webkins was the first uh, innovative uh, toy from Canada, from uh, North America. It actually did uh, uh, was a toy, was a plush toy, plush toy, and, uh, and actually had a environment, a virtual environment. It wasn't yet a, a virtual world when you could uh, take the, the code, the unique, unique code, and put into the site, and then the, the very nice uh, dog or whatever uh, started to walk in uh, the site, and uh, you could feed him and have uh, points and everything. 
So when we first brought it to Israel, it was uh, 2009, and it was only in uh, English. And here we could uh, create really in uh, marketing uh, methods, we could create uh, really a lot of, uh, uh, um, you know, a lot of kids uh, wanted to buy it. And, uh, and then in some point they couldn't play really and enjoy because the, it was not uh, in Hebrew. And then we get, got into the point that we really uh, support the company in uh, North America to, to translate it, which was a lot, a lot, a lot of work. But without this, uh, the kids couldn't really enjoy. So you don't do it maybe for uh, 8 million uh, people uh, country, but you do it for the BRICS or whatever. So I think it's important. Yeah, and then. Okay. I'm just saying that if resources are limited, then it's better off to invest in the quality of the product than only later on in customizations and, and, and localizations. If you, if you can afford localization, then good for you. But if you can't, you better be good than localized. I was expecting you to disagree with Noah, but uh, this time yeah, I'll, I'll do it, the I'll do it uh, on the next yeah. one. <laughs> but just uh, I will keep neutral as the moderator, but I can say that both stores push you in the app stores. Both stores push you very, very strongly to do localization, and they claim to have uh, researchers showing that, uh, that it works. So For that, I must agree. We know that uh, when it comes to the store exploration, then uh, localizing and translating the content there for sure impacts conversion. So people enjoy reading in the store in their language, that's for sure. So you say translate the marketing, but inside the product is less important. If the product, if you know, it uh, <laughs> attracts kids, right, it attracts kids, so it needs to be very visual, yes. Okay, we are about marketing here, what happens later <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, okay, what do you think about social media? I mean, theoretically, the kids that we are talking about, most of them are not supposed to be on Facebook, Instagram. I'm not even sure if according to the policy they are supposed to be there or not. I know my daughter is there, but probably she's not supposed to be there. Um, but do you, do you see it as a source for, uh, for, for getting to your audience, the social media, although it's not really supposed to be for these ages? Um, yes, I, I think there is, uh, but I said it cautiously. Um, obviously, with the likes of YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you know, they are you know, 40, 13 plus markets. Um, but we're seeing huge stars being created from you know, the likes of YouTubers, for example. Um, and if you look at the young chap, Evan, who makes $1.3 million a year, and he's like 10. So, you know, and that's from unwrapping new products, sharing uh, his reviews on different different things. Um, so it is important, and I think it can be, you know, done in the right way. Um, but again, you just have to be careful. And I think brands are a little bit uncomfortable with doing it. Um, and that's partly because there isn't much else out there uh, to sort of cater for the under 13s. Um, I, I guess I, one thing which we've sort of, um, of taken or acquired recently is uh, an app called uh, Pop Jam, which is the Instagram for kids. So it's basically focused for um, and targeting seven to twelve year olds. Um, if you, I don't know, if you're looking to reinvent Nickelodeon, for example, uh, in today's generation of kids, then I, I would say Pop Jam uh, is is that app. Yes, yeah. So I think that uh, I can share with you my uh, experience uh, with uh, kids under Nickelodeon when we have really uh, very strong uh, media. So today when we open uh, Instagram for uh, one of our uh, series or shows, uh, it doesn't matter if it's for uh, the segment of kids, uh, you know, we're five, uh, eight, 10 or, or eight, uh, 14, uh, because we have a drama series uh, for, for uh, uh, mature kids. So we see that uh, we have in, in one week uh, 150,000 uh, kids here in Israel in the Instagram of SpongeBob, of uh, Greenhouse, Hamama, or Shkuna, or whatever. So uh, today we use this tool. The kids are not in Israel, the kids are not at uh, Facebook. I think everybody knows. Uh, this is the tool for the platform for uh, their parents, so they don't want to use it anymore. So they are uh, only on uh, Instagram and Snapchat and everything, 
but uh, you can see that they react really uh, very strongly to uh, all posts in all uh, segments. So we see it in the web, we see it uh, in uh, Instagram, we see it uh, everywhere. We use many times our uh, stars, if they are not animations. They are real stars, we use them uh, in order to uh, show the kids many new things, products, uh, and abilities. And uh, the kids, uh, they are on it, hands on all the time, and uh, we see it works very good. So uh, uh, we are great believers in uh, this media. Well, I think you have to use it smartly because if you push too much, you know, they <laughs> say bye bye. Um, I can share that uh, we have hundreds of thousands of likes on Facebook for Kizi. Um, we sometimes get comments, uh, the likes are from parents, right? So the kids play and they use their Facebook Facebook profile of the parent to like, and then they write us and they say, I'm her kid. <laughs> so it's really cute to see that they communicate with us and they use sometimes the Facebook of parents. So this is one interesting uh, aspect. Um, in general, me too, I see kids around, I mean, I have a 12 and a half year old and a 10 year old and a seven year old. So the 12 and a half, the, uh, his friends are, many of them are on Instagram. So this is something for sure we need to explore. Uh, when you think about it globally, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's something I think is worth an interest. Okay. By the way, yeah, you asked me to disagree, so I will. <laughs> uh, we're actually the anti-social tool. Um, b because we're dealing with kids under the age of 10, we're actually blocking links to Facebook, and I think that's the second uh, uh, most popular a blocked link on kiddos Facebook. The first one is in a purchase, uh, which we're blocking. Uh, and and, and I, we don't think like kids under the age of 10 shouldn't be on Facebook and this is what we're preventing. But we do use uh, those social arenas for to recruit parents, but not kids. Okay, interesting. Um, so we are running out of time, but uh, anything of uh, one main tip you can give to the audience? I do know that there are uh, developers that started a company for uh, making apps for uh, kids. There are some that talked earlier, so do you have any, the, the, b the best tip you can give for someone trying to, mar to do marketing for kids or for families? Um, I can speak from the product perspective. Um, look for missed opportunities in your uh, flow to add that uh, retention effect, that brand effect, that experience that you want your players to feel and come back to you again and again. And there are always some missed opportunities. So go and play your games as your own user, watch others play them, and look for those small missed opportunities where you can put in your brand even better into the product and get that retention effect, get them to come back because they love you. So I would like to uh, give uh, something about the segmentation that we were talking about. Uh, many times you have a brand or a game that uh, you think maybe it's, uh, let's say, 8 to 12. So I think one, one of the key points in uh, marketing uh, to a uh, uh, wide uh, uh, age class is, is uh, w when you have this, uh, uh, this opportunity, you must uh, do the marketing to the higher uh, uh, age class. Because uh, uh, young kids, they will uh, react very good to older kids. But older kids will never react good to younger kids. So if you will take a brand and you think, oh, it's 8 to 12, let's uh, put it in the platforms for, for 8, the 12 will, will never come. But if you put it uh, to the platforms of the older kids, the youngest will always uh, join. So this is something uh, that I can contribute. Thanks, Yael. This was a very specific tip. Uh, Fabian? Um, yeah, I mean, one, one thing I would always say, and I, I keep sort of banging on about it, but it's, it's about keeping content fresh and unique and making the customer feel loved and valued. Um, because if you can you know, get them at a young age, um, for lack of a better word, then you have, you know, you know you, what, you, what you want to do is try and catch them uh, for life and you know, become a customer for life. And if you can have the brand and, and consumer relationship uh, thriving for years to come, then that can be then passed down to, to younger generations. But yeah, absolutely. It, it's all, for me, it's all about uh, creating the right content 
Um, and that's something that we try to do uh, and help brands do by providing them with the tools to, to be safe in the kids' industry uh, so that they can focus on the creating, creating the right content for, for the right audiences. So, I'm sorry if I'm pushing you to be very specific, but do you have any specific uh, tip that you can give? There's something that you tell brands, like when they advertise to kids, you give them very, some very specific tip that would help them reach the right audience or get the conversion or yeah. whatever they are targeting? When, when it comes to um, maybe a sort of certain ad formats, um, I'd say try and stay away from the, uh, you know, the normal sort of ad, ad formats like the banners and uh, some of the normal stuff that you, you see that we're used to. Uh, try to recreate stuff. Look at native ads, for example. Um, look at integrations, you know, ingraining the, a brand's DNA within, uh, you know, within certain properties. That's probably the best way to keep them engaged and, and to keep it, keep it interesting for them. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely be creative um, and look at different ways and different you know, ideas that could work uh, with your brand. I'll, I'll follow up on him and say, don't, adver don't advertise, um, create fun and meaningful engagement with, uh, with your audience. Uh, I would give an example I made up. Say I'm Colgate and I'm launching my new brush. And instead of doing a pre-roll, a distracting pre-roll on, you know, on, on kids' videos, every time they want to watch whatever they want to watch, I would come up with a game that teaches kids how to brush and you know when they progress, they win the super brush. So so they, they they will get a higher value of your brand. So that's that's definitely go towards content and not ads, and and be safe. Uh, I would the small tip that I could give is stay for Shy Summit. Uh, uh, you know lecture later on. I think he'll, he'll describe the uh, the danger side of of creating content and and uh, apps for kids. So do stay, and you know and you know. Help is coming, so don't stay strong. <laughs> and always wear uh, sunscreen. Always wear sunscreen. Yeah. Okay, so we'll continue the. So thanks everyone. It was very interesting. Really, some very direct tips. <laughs>